Welcome everyone. Welcome back to Tanya for Life. We are now starting chapter 20 of the Alter Rebbe's Tanya. So let's get into it. In the previous chapters, the Alter Rebbe discussed the Torah's assertion that it is very near to us to fulfill all the commandments with the love and fear of God. And remember, the fact that it's very near, this is a pasuk from Devarim, the, from the Torah itself that Hashem tells us. And uh, the whole, whole Tanya is based on teaching us how it really is very close to us. So he explained that it is indeed very near by means of the natural love of God, which is inherent in every Jew. He further stated that this love stems from the faculty of Chachmah, the divine soul, in which the light of the Ein Sof is clothed. This love is the source of a Jew's power of self-sacrifice. It is what inspires every Jew, regardless of spiritual stature, to forfeit his life rather than deny God's unity. In fact, were a Jew to feel that sins tear him away from God, he would actually never sin. His love for God and his fear of separation from Hashem would not permit it. It is only the spirit of folly inspired by the klippa, the self-delusion, that sin does not weaken his attachment to God, that allows him to sin. But when he is confronted with an attempt to coerce him to practice idolatry, for example, no such delusion is possible. Clearly, he is being torn away from God. Thereupon, a Jew's inherent love of God is aroused, and even the most hardened sinner willingly suffers martyrdom for his faith in the one God. This same power of self-sacrifice, says the Alter Rebbe, can enable a Jew to refrain from every transgression and to fulfill all the commandments. But if in fact only a clear challenge to one's faith such as idolatry arouses and activates one his, one's hidden love how can this love serve to motivate one's observance of all the commandments the altar begins to provide the answer in this chapter by explaining the relationship of all the positive commandments to this precept of belief in god's unity stated in the first of the ten commandments Ani Hashem lekecha, I'm Hashem your God. and all of the prohibitive commandments to the prohibition of idolatry the second commandment in the decalogue you shall have no other gods. Lo yelecha Hashem elekim acherim. Hashem elehim acherim. Wow, so cool. Okay, so this is what we are going to answer in this chapter. That if the power of um, our love of Hashem that is deep within our neshama um, will not allow us to um, be separate from Hashem, um, and do something that is obviously um, separating us from him, like serving idols. And we can use this um, love, <clears throat> sorry, this innate love of Hashem to inspire and motivate us to do all of the other commandments. How is it that we can still um, um, not keep all the commandments? We all have this love in us, but it's it's easy not to necessarily keep all the commandments, um, all the positive and all the negative. And so this is going to get into it. It is well known that the positive commandment to believe in God's unity and the admonition concerning adultery, which formed the first two commandments in the Decalogue, I am Hashem, your God, and you shall have no other gods, comprise the entire Torah. For the commandment, I am God contains all the 248 positive precepts, while the commandment, you shall have no other gods, contain all the 365 prohibitive commandments. I love this, Tara. This is so special for me. Um, that is why we had we heard only these two commandments when Hashem talked to us on Har Sinai. I am Hashem, and you shall not have other gods. Directly from God, we heard those. While the other eight commandments were transmitted by Moshe, as our sages have said, for they are the sum total of the entire Torah. Thus, we actually heard the entire Torah from Hashem himself, for all the commandments are contained within these two, as are particulars within a generalization. Therefore, just as one's love of God motivates him to obey these two commandments, even at the expense of his life, it may also serve to motivate him to observe all the commandments. However, oh, that's amazing. That is so cool. I, I didn't think of it that way. That um, those two commandments that we heard by Hashem have like the biggest impact on, on our soul today. Because if we see 
obviously that we are, and it's clear to us that we are serving an idol, we're serving a, a, a God other than Hashem, then we will for sure like choose to to expire and you know our life in this world. We 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 really it's within all of our souls to do so. So isn't that amazing that that that's the one that those are the ones that Hashem really spoke to us. Um, but this is saying even deeper that there are all the other commandments come from it. So however, this concept requires further clarification. Why should all the positive precepts be considered as affirmations of Hashem's unity? And why should all the prohibitions be manifestations of idol worship? It is readily understood that belief in Hashem is the basis of all the commandments. The Mechilta illustrates this idea by the parable of a king who entered a land and was requested by the populace to provide them with a system of laws. To this, the king replied, first accept me as your king. Afterward, I will issue my decrees. In the same way, belief in the one God constitutes the foundation upon which all the other commandments are built. But why should the two commandments regarding Hashem's unity be considered the sum total of the entire Torah all the other commandments being merely an extension of them. The explanation is based on a deeper understanding of the concept of the unity of Hashem. God's unity means not only that there is but one creator, but that God is the only existing being. All of existence is absolutely nullified before him and completely one with him. Therefore, when, when, when one acts in defiance of Hashem's will, as expressed in the commandments, he sets himself apart from Hashem as though he were a separate and independent entity. This constitutes a denial of Hashem's unity and the transgressor is therefore considered an idolater. This the Altar Rebbe now explains in detail. In order to elucidate this matter clearly, we must first briefly speak of the idea and the essence of the unity of Hashem, who is called one and unique. We must understand the essential meaning of this phrase, which lends itself to various interpretations, that there is only one Hashem, one creator, that he is one being, not a compound of various powers and so on. All believe that he is one alone. Now after creation exactly as he was before the world was created, when he was obviously alone, since nothing else had yet come into being, so too, now after creation, nothing exists apart from him. As it is written in the prayer book, you are he who was before the world was created, and you are he who is since the world was created. If the meaning of this passage were only that Hashem is eternal, without beginning or end, it could have been stated simply, you were before the world was created. Why the circumlocution of you are he who was before the world was created? This emphasis provided by the repeated phrase, you are he who was created, who, who had, was created before, means you are exactly the same he before and after creation without any change. As it is written, I, the Lord, have not changed. Since creation, God is still one alone, despite the presence of myriad beings, as the Alter Rebbe goes on to explain. For this world's, and likewise, all the supernal worlds do not affect any change in his unity by their having been created out of a state of nothingness. Just as Hashem was a, one alone, single and unique before they were created, so is he one alone, single and unique after he created them. How can this be so? What of all the creatures that exist beside of him? It is so because all is everyone and everything is as if it doesn't exist beside Hashem. The Alter Rebbe now goes on to clarify this point. His explanation in brief is all of creation came about through the word of Hashem. As we see with man, one word has no value whatsoever next to his power of speech, which has the capacity to allow him to go on speaking endlessly. It has even less value compared to one's power of thought. The source of speech and next to the soul itself, from where both thought and speech derive, one word or even many words is certainly a non-entity. How much more so then that in comparison with Hashem, who is infinite, his word, which represents his creative and animative powers, 
is as totally non-existent. What follows is a lengthy exposition of this concept, which is carried over into the next chapter. For the coming into being of all the upper and lower worlds out of nothingness and their life and their existence, i.e. that force which sustains them, so that they do not revert to nothingness and naught as they were before they were created. Unlike the product of a human craftsman, which if left undisturbed will remain in exactly the same state and shape as it was when it was left in the hand of the craftsman. The continued existence of creation is dependent on the constant renewal of the creative power. Were this power to cease, all of creation would revert to nothingness. This force which animates and sustains the existence of all creation is nothing other than the word of Hashem and the breath of his mouth, which is clothed in these worlds. To illustrate from the soul of a human being, when a man utters a word, this single word is, is absolutely nothing, even when compared only to his articulate soul, i.e. his power of speech as a whole, which is the soul's middle garment, i.e. the organ of expression, namely its faculty of speech. The soul has three garments, thought, speech, and action, of which speech is the middle one, with action being lower than it and thought higher. One word has no value, even in comparison with this faculty. Since this faculty can produce an infinite number of words, and next to infinity, one word has no value whatsoever, in actual practice, there is a limit to the number of words one can speak. However, this is only because the physical organs involved in speech have a limited functional ability. The soul's capacity for speech is limitless. Surely then, this word has no value when compared to the soul's innermost garment, i.e. that garment which is closest to the soul itself, namely its faculty of thought, which is the source of speech and its life force. Since thought is higher and closer to the soul than is speech, this one word surely has no value in comparison with it. It goes without saying that this word is as naught when compared with the essence and entity, as opposed to the garments of the soul, these being its ten attributes mentioned above, chachma, bina, da'at, and so on. Um, so on is the seven emotional attributes. From which are derived the letters of thought that are clothed in one speech when it is added. Since all of man's thoughts are, ne are either of an intellectual or an emotional nature. They derive from the soul's intellectual or emotional faculties. When one speaks the letters of his thought, when one speaks, the letters of his thought descend to a lower level. For thought too, like speech, consists of letters, except that the letters of thought are more spiritual and refined. Thus thought and speech share a common characteristic. But the ten attributes, chachma bina da'at, and so on, are the root and source of thought. And before being clothed in the garment of thought, they as yet lack the elements of letters. The letters are formed only when one applies his thoughts to a particular idea or a feeling, as explained further. Since the intellectual and emotional soul powers are so subtle and amorphous that they cannot be defined even in terms of the spiritual thought letters, they are obviously of an altogether different, more spiritual order than thought. And the spoken word is surely without value in comparison to them. What follows is a description of the process where the letters of thought are formed. So for example, when a man suddenly becomes conscious of a certain love or a desire in his heart before it has risen from the heart to the brain to meditate on it and ponder it, it has not yet acquired the element of letters. It is only a pure desire and longing for the object of his affection. All the more so before he began to feel in his heart a craving and desire for that thing when it was yet confined within the realm of his intellect, in his chokma, or in his understanding, corresponding to binna, and knowledge, da'at. 
meaning that the thing was known to him to be desirable and gratifying, something good and pleasant to attain and to cling to, as, for instance, to study a certain discipline or to eat some delicacy. Then in this state of intellectual appreciation of the desirable object, before the appreciation has been even developed into emotion, there are certainly no letters present in one's mind. Only after the desire and craving have already descended into his heart, i.e. after they have developed into emotions through the stimulus of his wisdom, understanding and knowledge, and only after they have ascended once again from the heart back to the brain to think and meditate on how to implement his desire by actually obtaining that food or actually studying that subject. It is only at this point when one applies his thoughts to implementing his desire that letters are born in one's mind, corresponding to the language of each of the nations who employ these letters when speaking and thinking about everything in the world, i.e., each of us thinks in our own language. Pure feeling, however, i.e., feeling that has not yet reached the applied, implemental stage of thought, transcends differences of nation and language since it does not express itself in letters. From all this, we may understand the Alter Rebbe's earlier statement that a spoken word is utterly without value in comparison with the soul's intellectual and emotional powers, which are described here for our purposes as the essence of the soul. Surely then, the divine word by which God creates and animates all the words has no value at all next to Hashem, who is truly and absolutely infinite. Thus all the worlds created and sustained by the divine word are as if non-existent from Hashem's perspective, and their presence does not affect any change in his unity. This theme will be further discussed in the following chapter. Amazing. Okay, so we finished chapter 20. This is so powerful. I think it's so important for us to, to know um, the way that the way that we work. Let me highlight that this whole section here is really teaching us how our desires work. So our desires for the good and for the for the negative. That either um either a desire comes from below. So from our heart, and then our heart um, pumps all of this up, this um this pure feeling, this feeling up to um our our you know our, our mental faculties, our brain. And from there it starts to develop our brain starts to think about it, think about what, what is this feeling in my heart? And, um, you know, the more meditative power we leave there to focus on um, and understand this feeling and sit in this feeling that came from the heart, um, the more it becomes present in a tangible way in terms of, you know, what we're saying here is the letters, that actually the letters... Um, the Hebrew letters of its existence become more apparent. And and I think it's interesting because that's where we start thinking about it more and more. We start to think, oh, you know, process of elimination. Sometimes it could be, what is it that I want? It could be, um, do I feel like this? Do I feel like that? Um, oh, if, if you're looking at like food, for example, you can be looking for something to satisfy that craving. So at the beginning, it's just a craving, um, but then you start adding letters and words to it, and that comes after. And um, that's when it starts getting grounded in, in, in what it is, right? The more mental capacity we leave to, um, to understand it, right? The same works, and, and then it becomes... It, it passes all the way down into all of our emotional faculties. Um, and then when it gets to uh, Netzach, 
<laughs> I can imagine when it gets to the Netzach faculty of conquering, um, then for sure I think it will be hard to to um, negate the 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 feeling or desire, um, and to to do the other way um, and to not listen to it if that is um, what we want because the the Netzach faculty is something that that conquers so this desire will look to conquer over everything and it will be your one thing that you're going to be doing that you know so this is how how amazing is it that Hashem it's one of the commandments and I love this commandments um, that we read in the Shema every day is um, that you shouldn't go after your heart's desire like don't look for your heart's desire because if you follow your heart which is an emotional being and it is the seat the, the the palace of the animal soul so someone especially who who doesn't work so much on refining their heart and refining their animal soul will surely you know experience this in a big way all of what we said um you know he's not in the habit of saying no to his heart so then but it's, it's actually a mitzvah that we should be motivated to do um because we are not meant to be bestial animal beings. We are meant to be, um, you know, Hashem gave us the faculty of intellect for a reason. Uh, he gave us the godly soul, which sits in intellect. He gave us the godly soul for a reason to parent this um, animal uh, uh, child, this animal soul, this um, child of us, right? So, so, the other way that things can can like desire can come up is <clears throat> and feeling can come up is it starts in our head. It can start in our head and it can come down and, and really have effect in our heart and make us feel a certain way. And that's why being careful with your with a person's speech um, and even thought, because we said already that thought and speech and action are just faculties of um the garments of the soul right so they sit really close to the soul and we learned that the faculty of speech sits closest to the soul and the faculty of the faculty of thoughts sits closest to the soul the faculty of speech next and then the faculty of action asiya is is furthest from the soul's in intimacy but um, it's still part of its expression. So it is just a garment, but through that garment, we have effect and we can bring out the expression of our soul. So when we're um, thinking a certain way, then we'll encourage certain thoughts to continue coming. And that thought, and, and I love this. So it's it's based in Tanya, I'm not sure which chapter, but um all of this learning i remember learning that you can the importance it's so important first of all the altar Rebbe teaches us in his um in his halacha of making a fence around our property right like the 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 halacha of putting a fence around your property lest someone falls from the rooftop and injures themselves right it should not happen but that's, for example, how Hashem has, has commanded us to take care of ourselves and others, right? The Alter Rebbe says, yes, it's the physical taking care. You have to have boundaries on your rooftop so someone doesn't fall and physically damage themselves, but also on an emotional and mental and spiritual level is that this same halacha is also commanding us to keep a fence around our brain around our mind because our mind if it if we don't put a fence around our soul powers which which are um you know existing through our mental um capacity then which then goes on to 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 go through speech and action so if we don't put our a fence to claim our soul faculties then all the, the someone else including ourselves can come to damage right I think this is amazing this is fire this Torah is fire this is amazing for me so 
when we don't claim, Miriam explains it like this, when we don't claim our soul faculties, then these hoodlum entities, right, these hoodlums can come and use it for themselves, right? They can take a hold of it and they can harness all of our soul powers, chas v'chalila, and then we'll have unrefined thinking, speaking, acting, because all of our soul powers are now hijacked, so to speak. Um, so that, again, is within our control. And that is why the, the, the Rebbe warned um, and, and told us to be very cautious that after davening, one must learn Torah. You don't have to have davened a lot and you don't have to have learned a lot of Torah, but it's so imperative to seal up your davening with Torah learning because once you've davened, your soul powers are out and about. They're like, have been, they've been able to come into your body and now it makes it more accessible for the animal, so to speak, the animal soul or whatever forces, right? So that is why the halacha comes in to say, now you must claim now you must put up a fence. It's not enough just to exist and to, to, to live here and to, you know, allow the soul to come in. You must protect um, yourself and others by putting up a fence and claiming your faculties. You have to um, for your own sake and for the sake of others. And this is a, 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 a command from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How amazing is it that Hashem, to, you know, commands us to, to take care of ourselves mentally and emotionally in this way and spiritually. So, so yeah, so this is, this is what's needed that le learning Torah right after is something that will claim our soul faculties for a Kedushitic way. And then we'll be more refined and less and less, um, will we fall to, um, react or, or, um, express ourselves in, in, uh, in an emotional, um, and animalistic way, right? So I think that's amazing. And so, for example, being careful with our thoughts as well. Oh, my gosh, this is such beautiful Torah. It's so important for us to be careful with our thoughts. The Alter Rebbe teaches that you have to put not just one hand up to a thought. You have to put two hands up. If it's a thought that you don't want to um, um, entertain, you have to put two hands up, right? And it's something that it's hard to really intellectually grasp. Um, it's more something that when, when you go through the experience of it, you can say, uh, now I understand what that means. Um, because again, remember the reason that we're doing this is because it's so easy for our heart to come up with a feeling and to um, get our brain to think about it right? And remember, our heart doesn't, just because it comes from our heart does not mean it is who we are and does not mean it is um, something that, that um, is, is, if we don't listen to it, doesn't mean we're not, we're, we're shutting off ourself, right? Some things can come from the animal soul, the unrefined animal soul, and depending on a person's animal soul state at the moment, um, it can be very coarse or it can be more refined, not so coarse yet, right? So the desire can be for a person who's not so, a, an animal soul that's not yet so coarse, then it can be like small things that are, you know, permissible, but not um, not good to continue doing, right? Like indulging, self-satisfaction, all of that stuff will add coarseness onto the animal soul and make it stronger and stronger and stronger. And then it's going to start desiring more things that are completely not okay, um, which we've talked about many times. But that's from, from going into something, from indulging in self-satisfaction in things that are permissible, right? It can lead to something um, prohibited, right? For example, the, the classic is... is um, with food we must eat food every single day um so i mean we we eat food every day it's part of our taking care of ourselves but it can also easily be switched into um a form of um indulgence and self-satisfaction right so if all your food is kosher amazing 
then it can be, you know, overeating. So a step of overeating uh, um, can actually, because it's the reason a person overeats is important. So if a person's overeating, it's obviously more than what the body needs. It's more than what is necessary. So that leads to it being something of self-satisfaction. It, it's an indulgence form, right? So if a person is indulging and looking for self-satisfaction in their food, then um, that will coarsen the animal soul and then it will start to want more and more. It's not going to be satisfied just with that. Again, remember, think of water elements, self-satisfaction, um, desire. It all comes from the water element. So this water element, which the animal soul has in abundance, depending on who the person is, um, remember Hashem gave a different concentration to each person, each person's soul. So a person who has a lot of water element will have a lot of um, desire um, without boundaries. Desire is something in its nature. Water is something in its nature that has no boundaries. So it will not tell you to stop ever. It will only say, I want more. And it will continue this desire. And it will you know, graduate into more and more bigger and bigger things. So, so whenever we're thinking, oh, it'll be just this, that's not true. <laughs> By its nature, it's never just this. By its nature, it's never, I'll just have this one time overeating and then that's it. Um, I'll, you know, that that's that's not the way it works. So so it's this is for us to to not have a magnifying glass of um heavy thinking on us and attacking ourselves. This is the all this learning is so that we have more understanding of ourselves and how we work and have more appreciation and able to lean on HaKadosh Baruch Hu, his love for us, his unconditional support of us and belief in us. Um, so we have to come from that point of view, not judging ourselves. And remember, anytime there's judgment, it causes a person to close up and to close the door. But we, through doing this Tanya, we're trying to open the door open the door to our behaviors, our um, negative and positive behaviors, open the door to allow Hashem to come in because Hashem won't just come in. He respects our space and our boundaries. No matter what we're doing, we must open the door for him. And as long as we're judging ourselves, we will be closing the door just naturally. That That's just the way it is. That's just the way that I've experienced it as well. So by remembering that Hashem has unconditional love for us, remembering who we really are, that we have this beautiful, godly soul that, you know, it's here for a purpose, that we even know why our animal soul is so strong and unrefined. It actually comes from such a high spiritual source that that this is what it's meant to happen, that it's it's going to go through this tough process of refining, um, which is avoida. It is toiling. Um, and um, we just remember that we're part of the, this is what Hashem wanted from us, right? Um, and this is the avoider that he wanted from us. So, and how amazing is that? So we have this, um, this animal soul that will start to want more and more and more if there's no boundaries put on it. And we allow it to just take whatever it wants and desires. So that is the danger of um, running after your heart's desire, right? And that is the prohibition that we have not to run after your heart's desire um, in the, the Shema that we say every day from the Torah, right? So how important is this? Because, okay, and why is this important? It's also a, a, a mitzvah of the Brit Milah. Again, the Brit Mila is not just the 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 um the eight days pidyon uh, bris, not just the bris for a, a boy. It's also uh on the mouth. It's Mila is words, so we also have to have a bris Mila um on our speech and on our eating, on our faculty of the mouth, right? So that's also part of the same it's another it's the command that we receive from this command as well works on another level as well 
right? Because again, Hashem is infinite. So there, are, it's, it, it just makes sense that it's not necessarily just the one way. It's so many ways that we can see the halakha um, going into different aspects, mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical. So to have this bris milah is so important to control your faculty of speech. Do it for the sake of Hashem said that I have to do it. Hashem said I have to restrain my speech, that I can't just flow freely. And, you know, Zera Levatala is also uh, speech related. Zera Levatala is um, wasting seed, but seed is also speech. Levatala, Zera Levatala is also um, wasting your speech. So Hashem said, don't waste your speech. Don't just speak idly. Don't chit chat. Um, stum. Use your words for a purpose um, and make it holy. Make your words holy. Um, spread Kedusha wherever you are. Um, so all of this is, again, uh, teaching us that how Hashem understands us and he's helping us to reach the next level. So in order to reach the next level, we can't just rely on our natural instinct, so to speak, natural, like the animal natural instinct, we have to refine that. We have to refine this animal. We have to refine this part of us. Um, and it will, like a shining off a diamond and getting rid of all the dust and dirt, it will make way for the pure and beautiful um, attributes that live within the animal soul. It will um make it it will reveal to the animal soul that she or he is actually a beautiful prince or princess of a Baruch Hu, a beloved firstborn son that Hashem has been that the king has been looking for remember the story of that little prince who was taken away at such a young age taken by pirates and he returns as a pirate um to pillage and do whatever he's doing, all of this destruction. And someone notices his birthmark and says, oh my goodness, this is the long lost son of the king. And he takes him to the king and the king sees him and everything from there, it's history. The king is so happy to see him. It doesn't matter what he's done. This is his son that he's 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 been yearning for forever. And that is the experience of the soul. And the soul can, our animal soul can experience this feeling this um revelation um through this refinement and through this giving it love and i love this um this way of dealing with the Sahara, this way of dealing with the animal soul and all of its you know trying to refine ourselves because the other way is pulling at it tugging at it with a chain and saying come this way don't do that don't do this um and that doesn't work <laughs> it does not work very well in the long term to, to tug your animal soul up with a chain and pull it this way and that way and say, don't, don't look at that or don't have those lustful feelings or et cetera, et cetera, um, and do this and, and do this Kadusha stuff. Um, that doesn't work either. So, so um, it's about putting, like Miriam says, like hanging a piece of meat in front of the, the animal, this wild animal and say, oh, if you want this meat, if you want all these good things, come with me. I, I can show you where to get it. If you want to feel good about yourself, come with me. Hashem has it for you. You know, we can rely on Hashem's love for us. You are actually his beloved son, long lost son. So it doesn't matter what you've done. Um, and it doesn't matter what you've thought and what you felt um, and what you've said. You are untouched by any of the negativity and you are still Hashem's beloved and he believes in you and that's why you're here. You know, so to to speak to our animal soul as if it's a child um, and to to teach it and really to have emuna in it for itself that sometimes, you know, you can we thought we talked about in last class, sometimes you don't really have our emuna can can waver, um, depending on who you are. Um, some people more than others, but emuna is something that we have to work on daily, and we do work on it daily in our davening. We work on believing that Mashiach will come. This world and all the suffering and all that that happens in it, it will come to an end. There will be light at the end. We believe in it. <laughs> in fact, the Rebbe said. 
in consoling a, a, a grieving mother, he said, when Mashiach comes, you can ask him all your questions. You can ask him why. Um, so we believe in Mashiach. And we also believe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us unconditionally. And we also believe that he has Imuna in us. The fact that we're here today means that we have another day of fulfilling our mission. And he believes that we will. And um, to, to rely on this Imuna, this faith that Hashem loves us unconditionally, still, even after everything that we did a moment ago, after everything that we did yesterday or the day before or in our childhood or whatever it is, and Hashem still has love for every single one person around us, no matter what they've done. So we have to rely on Hashem's um, belief and Imuna in us. And Bizar Hashem, we should develop that Imuna from Hashem into ourselves as well. Because Hashem loves me, I can love myself. Um, because Hashem loves this person, even though they did all these things, I can still love them. I'll change the way I behave around them. Yes, I can change, you know, I have to set up boundaries. That's that's Hashem taught us we have to set up boundaries. But a boundary is not something that is backed by fiery emotion. That is a barrier and that is not correct. Um, like we learn, if someone is being disciplined, which is where boundaries come from, if someone is being disciplined, um, they must discipline with the left hand of Gvura, but with the right hand of Chesed, they bring them close, right? A child, that you bring the child close and you make sure that even through the discipline, or even after the discipline, the child still knows that you love them unconditionally. That is so important. So, so too with everybody. We're not supposed to hold and harbor negative feeling for another person <laughs> in our heart or in our minds. We are meant to um, come from this love, unconditional love, because we are, you know, brethren, you know, Abbas Yisrael, um, that we come from Hashem that we should love each other and still, yeah, have distance and, and change the way you behave with different people, but um, always have, always work on developing this love. And again, this, these things, it's just, it's Torah is just so connected. It's so amazing. When we start one thing, we, we lead to another thing, we lead to another thing, and it all just helps to make everything make sense. So another point, which, which is about this Abbas Yisrael is, um, <laughs> like in Miriam's book, which is based on the Tanya. So Miriam's book, <coughs> excuse me, I believe it is Reaching New Heights in Health and Happiness, or it could be Kindness in Marriage book. Um, she talks about Avas Yisrael. How do we reach Avas Yisrael um, to love another person as yourself? First of all, um, it is important to love yourself. <laughs> a lot of us, some people can struggle with it, um, but it is okay to rely on Hashem's love for us, unconditional love. And it's okay if we don't feel it. It's okay to know it intellectually. Um, it will, like we learned in this chapter, intellectual thoughts and feelings start, they can start off here and they can end up going into the heart, coming back to the mind to recalibrate, redelve you know understand this feeling and then you know move it on to the whole body so it can be a whole experience so that's why um that's why the more learning Torah that we do the more accepting uh, you know davening to pu purify us and learning Torah to fill us up with HaKadosh Baruch Hu's way of seeing things we can more and more uh, become holy and refine our thinking and feeling and actions um, and our uh, fill our godly soul with more and more strength um, to to support and encourage and guide our animal soul to be more refined and to show its true diamond um, and that's <clears throat> so um so so first of all, yes, we have to love ourselves. It is a command that we must love ourselves. In order to have Abbas Yisrael, you have to love yourself as Hashem loves you. And you have to share that love. You have to love others as Hashem loves them. Just like he loves you, he loves them. But this is not a love without boundaries. This is a love with boundaries, of course, because this world is all about making um, a tikkun, fixing for all the 
um, uh, for all that needs fixing, right? So for example, in the upper heavens, um, in the time Hashem created the world before this one, <clears throat> he created a world with just the spherot in strong, strong, they were in their primordial space. So chesed was chesed completely. Gvura was gvura completely. They were so strong and polar opposites that they couldn't get along and they broke, they shattered. And all of those pieces of shattering is what Hashem used in the next world to create us. So we have these pieces of shattered vessels. It's talked about shattered vessels, which is um, what we have to make tikkun with. So how do we do it? We we do, again, like our, 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 our um, command when disciplining a child, <clears throat> you have to have one with the other. You have to have gvura with chesed. You have to make sure that the child knows you love them unconditionally, even though you are disciplining them. And you're not disciplining them because they're bad. You're disciplining them, putting boundaries up because of the actions, um, et cetera, right? Um, so, and I remember Rabbi Sachs was talking about the same thing that, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was disciplining and, and speaking to the, um, the Yidin in the Midbar, he would discipline them without any anger inside of him. He ca came from inside his heart. He had love for them outside. He was stern. He could be stern and firm and tell them off, but he didn't have this fiery hatred or anger inside of him. And that's so important to develop. Obviously, we have an animal soul and the animal soul reigns, has reigned in our um, life from the moment we gave, we were born. So it is the older and the godly soul, which is the guiding soul, only came in after Bar Bar Mitzvah. So obviously our animal soul has a, a lot more, um, um, what's it called, comfort in the body that <clears throat> they know each other very well and, and um, we have to work extra hard to to um, undo uh, and to refine the animal soul and to have more power of our godly soul in our body. <laughs> but it is possible. Um, we have to toil at it. And yagati matati, if we, we toil, then we will find it. Um, we will be successful. Um, and so to take it back to Abba Sisrael, that um, no matter how our boundaries are, we still have to come from a love of the other person, <clears throat> a love for the other person. Um, it doesn't mean we're best friends. It just means that we have this cleanness and purity of heart. And it doesn't mean we're there yet. It can be a process we're working on. Um, because in order to have true of us as well, we have to love ourselves. And in order to love ourselves, we have to love Hashem. Um, so all of this is all connected. <clears throat> And coming back to um, what we were learning here of how either you can start with a feeling in your heart or in your mind. It can start with a thought or it can start with a feeling in your heart. What has to happen is there's time for your mind to process it. And as your mind processes it more and more and more, you know, these words come into being. It, it becomes a tangible thing um, in your mind in terms of like the words, right? as we learned, <clears throat> excuse me, and it, it has more and more power. And that power has um, the ability through the process of, of getting absorbed in the body, it will pass on and it will end up allowing our body um, to be a vehicle for the thought or for the feeling, um, which will be harnessed in thought. So that's why it's really important when we're refining ourselves. Miriam talks about anxious thinking you know if a person's thinking anxiously then they will feel anxious and they will start acting anxiously as well um anxious thinking anxious actions can be like avoiding um it can be shutting down fight or flight or freeze um for example you know which is all the fire element <laughs> um so this is why for example it's important to 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 put a boundary around our mind as well that we're not just going to allow our mind to think freely and 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 go wherever it will go necessarily 
because it could end up in harm's way. So we learn, <laughs> there's so much Torah, it's beautiful. So we learn that um, when Yosef was thrown into the pit, which was, according to the Torah, it was um, devoid of um, water. And Rashi explains that the, that it was empty, it was devoid of water, means that there were snakes and scorpions in it. So Hasidus teaches the fact that there was um, it was devoid of water, and then adding <clears throat> on it was empty and devoid of water. So that's two things that like it's it's and that's why Rashi comments on it because it's something that's redundant. Why would you say that it's devoid of water if you say it's empty? Obviously, it's empty if <laughs> and obviously there's no water in it if it's empty. Right. So then Rashi says, OK, so this is the, the meaning. The fact that it's devoid of water <clears throat> um, is snakes and scorpions um, were in it. So. Um, so the Hasidic teaching is when we have um, a space, a pit, for example, our mind is empty and devoid of Mayim, which is Torah. That is where snakes and scorpions will be in abundance. That's where they that's where they um, roam, right? In a place that is devoid of Torah. And that's why we have to fill and fill and fill our mind with Torah um, so that we can avoid all of these snake and scorpion-like thoughts, which are poisonous and harmful and destructive, right? So... <clears throat> Um, and again, remember that on our own power, you know, when we're sacrificing our beasts, for example, the the, the lustful water element or the anxious fire element, um, anxious fire element, we'd be giving the bull. We say, Hashem, I, I can't do this on my own, in my own mental space, in my own capacity. This is where I've come and I'm struggling. I need your help. I can't control it. Then we give it to Hashem. So that is... Um, um, where our own thinking, where our own seichel has led us. But we have the power and the ability to tap into the divine. We have the ability to, to open the door to our Kaddish Baruch Hu and, and, and receive Hashem's way of seeing what we're going through, Hashem's way of seeing things. Because we know Hashem gave us a situation. It's there for a reason. And there is the right way to go through it. There is a way to refine ourselves and be more Kaddishitic and have a... Uh, make a dwelling place for Hashem within our hearts, within our, our relationships and within the world, right? As a dogma. <clears throat> so Hashem, please teach me the way to go through it. And that comes through um, hum hum humbling ourselves with everything we are now, humbling our ourselves to say how we've been doing it isn't enough. My way is not the right way. I want to see your way, right? Because remember, we, we learned in the last chapter was um, uh, Koach Ma. That's where Kedusha comes from. Kedusha is about humbling yourself so Hashem can come in. That is Kedusha Dik, when a person's sincerely humble to Hashem. So <clears throat> when we are humble and we open the door to Hashem and we ask Hashem to come in to take this soul, this animal uh, soul, um, this fire element, this anxiety uh, provoking uh environment and all of its expressions of the mind of the thinking of the speech of the actions completely then we say um um then hashem will will i mean we learn torah after as well right so we learn torah to then receive hashem's understanding hashem's way of seeing things and what's amazing we talked about it in our forbringings after class is um how it's amazing that the Parsha every week really has the answers for all of our questions um, and things that we need resolving in our life. It's amazing that there's always an answer there. Um, so it's the same thing. Hashem has his answers for us. We just have to open the door and um, ask him to come in. Um, and so we were talking about opening, I mean, closing, um, putting two hands up to thoughts because sometimes the thoughts can be unrefined and snake and scorpion like thoughts those thoughts we have to put our hands up to if we put one hand up the Alter Rebbe says that we're not fully committed to um um 
to preventing this thought from entertaining our minds, like from being present, <clears throat> it will actually strengthen this thought that it will, it will be an exercise. So it won't come fully, but it will come and then it will go and then it will come back and it will go. And again, remember, this is something more that you'll understand as it's experienced. Um, so when the, the thought comes and then it goes, so it, it will make it even stronger and stronger because it's always there in the back of your mind. It's always there and you're always actively like fighting with it, right? The way to do it really, the Alter Rebbe says, is don't, don't put one hand up, put two hands up. Put two hands up so that if the thought comes up immediately, it knows, you know that you're not going to entertain it. You know that you're not allowing it in your space. So it has no choice but to, to, to not come up. <clears throat> and you switch your thinking to something else. You switch to something else in, intentionally. Um, and then it, it, it helps it to pass. And then it will come back a few times. But the more you do this, the more it will like just completely disappear. It just won't come back um, like the other so that's amazing <clears throat> it really is very strong and effective and to give um power to the imagery of it um which will help your seichel to, to deal with it as well um because again it's hard to understand just in intellect um but the story can speak to it and and the story is what we can think of when we're going through it is <clears throat> what uh uh who I don't remember the story in its details. I remember the 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 basics of it. So it was Rav, one of our rebbe's, um, was teaching uh, someone a chassid who came up to him and said, "I'm struggling with my thinking, um, my unrefined thoughts, um, whether it was depression or whatever feelings he was dealing with." Um, and the rebbe told him, "Go go to this uh, chassid who lives here in the snow." In the night, he went and he traveled to, to get to that chassid. Um, and he knocked on the door. He arrived there, he knocked on the door. He could see and he could hear people inside. The lights were on. He could hear everyone, you know, having a, a good time or whatever it was. No one opened the door for him. So he was knocking and knocking. He came around the windows. He was knocking everywhere he could. No one answered the door. And so he ended up uh, waking up there outside and, uh, and he, <clears throat> in the morning, the, the door opened and the owner of the house talked to him and um, he said, why didn't you invite me in before? Um, I've been waiting here the whole night. And he said, this is my home, my house. I let in who I want to let in. Who I don't want to let in, I won't let in. As simple as that. And I thought, and I think like that's so powerful because that is the way our mind is. Our mind is our home, it's our house. And truly, honestly, we have the power to close the door and um, be choosy with who we allow and to enter into our house. And it's not about thinking bad about the other person. It's not about the other person at all. It's not about the 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 thought at all. It's about us. <clears throat> it's about our house, our home. We need to protect it. So we get to choose who will come in. Irrelevant of what happens to that thought outside or that person outside. And I think that's amazing. And that's a way of we can see um, having boundaries in a healthy way. Um, <laughs> um, and again, the, obviously the, the, the chassid allowed this man into his home after um, after the whole night, you know, so it was timing as well. He 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 allowed him time when he would allow. Um, sometimes is not the right time. Sometimes is the right time. Um, whatever it is. So he chose who enters his home, when and how. And um, amazing. So with that, with that, let us do our meditation. <coughs> Let us do a meditation to allow the Torah that we learned today to enter more easily into our mind and into our hearts. So allow, I encourage everyone to sit in a comfortable position and really feel into your body. Exhale.
feel any restraints, any um, constrictions, any stiffness. And exhale out, breathing in. Exhaling it out. Curling the toes. Your lower body. Exhaling it out. Breathing in. Hashem's Kedusha. Hashem's Tar. Hashem's Secha. <clears throat> Hashem's speech into us, our life force. And tensing up your arms, your extremities, your lower body. Breathing out and letting go. So the absence of that tension The Kaddish Baruch Hu entering inside. You're opening a door for Hashem to enter in through your limbs. Moving upwards, tensing up your torso, your belly, your organs, your back, your shoulders. Breathing out. Breathing in. Again, opening the door for Hashem to come in. And imagine Hashem's speech bringing you into existence constantly. A true testament of his amuna in you, in all of these parts of your body and all of your upper body Imagine the bris milah over the mouth, the commandment to circumcise the mouth. Breathing out and in. Open the door for Hashem to your mouth. And imagine your mind, squeeze your brain, <laughs> Constru you know, in its tension, all the ways that we've been thinking, and drop, allow it to relax. Open the door to Kodesh Baruch Hu, that Hashem Sechel will take over. So we have more and more power, more and more strength to refine ourselves in an encouraging way, in an uplifting way. And imagine your ears, your face, your eyes, your heart also Tension, breathing out, and take on, open the door to Hashem, take on the mitzvahs to sanctify yourself, to sanctify your hearing, to sanctify your sight, to sanctify your heart, to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. So we can be a vessel for Hashem. That we can be a dwelling place for Hashem to be shared in the world, expressed in the world, just from us being a dogma. And imagine Hashem in his throne, his kisah kovat, his throne of glory, 
imagining him speaking words into the universe right now and creating absolutely everything from scratch. Rely on this power of renewal. This second is not the same as the last second. It has the strength to become something completely different. Because Hashem is constantly creating us from scratch. And feel Hashem's speech embracing us, pumping through our veins. And all those around us and rely on this love that Hashem has. Take your moments to breathe in as needed. Breathe in Hashem's love for you. It's creating of you and of the other. So now I encourage you to be present with wherever you are at. Come back. And with that, we have finished um, chapter 20 of Tanya. Next week, we'll be doing chapter 21. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time on Tanya for Life.